But the most useful device for the identification and apprehension of bank robbers is still the human eye and the human mind. I went by there and introduced myself, and the guy says, uh, oh, you're in England? I said, yeah. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, you know, it turned out he had moved up here from Ruskin. And he said, well, you know, I knew those boys. He said, they really weren't that bad. She was just like this. She was just quivering. And she said, they made me lie on the floor. They used to spend some summers in Columbia, so they were very familiar with the town. And they had a relative here, apparently, and when they were, were boys, they'd come over and spend time in Columbia. And a former mayor, James Green, used to go fishing with them, palling around with them, swimming at the swimming hole and so forth. I don't really know what size gun it was. All I can tell you is, is you could stick your fist down the barrel that far. <laughs> You know, they were trying to get as many of the uh, clues that they could come up with, and, and, and there just wasn't any to amount to anything. The brothers once again ran into Frank Morris at Alcatraz. It was not long before they decided to become the first to escape from the rock. They call it the rock, even if it is named for pelicans. Alcatraz Island rises from California's San Francisco Bay like an ancient monster. The U.S. penitentiary on Alcatraz Island was called the rock for a reason. So far as anyone knew, no inmate had ever escaped from the prison. The water of San Francisco Bay was cold, the currents were treacherous, and it was a long way to shore. The spoon proves mightier than the bars at supposedly escape-proof Alcatraz prison. Three bank robbers serving long terms scratch their way through grills covering an air vent, climbed a drainage pipe, and disappeared from the forbidding rock in San Francisco Bay. It appears to be the first successful escape in the history of the maximum security prison, and the flight is attributed by Warden Olin Blackwell to the deteriorating condition of the prison crumbling concrete and eroding metals with five million needed for repairs. No official has seen them since. Many authorities believe that their raft came apart and the men drowned in San Francisco Bay or were swept to their doom in the Pacific. They, uh, they converted things that you wouldn't think about into tools. I mean, they took a vacuum motor and made a power drill out of it. Uh, they used uh, sharpened uh, stems of spoons to dig through solid concrete, move, you know, partial inches at the time to slowly chip their way through the backs of cells. They used uh, the covers of notebooks uh, and painted them the color of the concrete to, to create replica walls to go into the back of their cells where they were digging their way out. Um, uh, I learned that uh, the Anglin brothers got through first uh, and then help Frank Morris get through. They made life preservers um, that when the FBI later tested these life preservers, they found that they would sustain air for an hour to three hours, no problem. And that it was relatively easy to just blow into them the way they had them set up and keep them inflated. Uh, that uh, their engineering worked. 
Uh, and that's something that I think is very underestimated by many people today. It was, you know, it was a, they were jailhouse engineers of the first order. I give them a lot of credit for that. The three men dug through the walls of their concrete cells and paddled away on the night of June 11, 1962. The U.S. Marshal Service maintains an active investigation of the case to this day. In fact, that is how historian and author Dale Cox found himself on the trail of the Alcatraz escape. It all started some 25 years after the three men pushed off in their raft. I was a reporter at uh, WJHG TV, that's a television station in Panama City, Florida back in the 1980s. And uh, I happened to be making rounds in uh, a small town called Mariana, Florida. And uh, in the process of making those rounds, the sheriff there casually mentioned to me that the U.S. Marshals were in town. And um, it's always kind of interesting when the Marshals are up to something. And so I asked him, you know, what, is, what are they up to? And he said, well, they're investigating something to do with the Alcatraz escape. And uh, like most people, what I knew about the Alcatraz escape at that time was, you know, Clint Eastwood's movie, Escape from Alcatraz. John P. McDaniel was the sheriff of Jackson County, Florida at the time. Well, they came to Mariana and I met them at the sheriff's office on a, I believe a Saturday. And he began to interview me about it, you know, and he uh, wanted to go to a, one of the relatives' house which would be just a little north and west of uh, Greenwood. He and Cox soon went to visit the U.S. Marshal in Tallahassee. And we met with uh, U.S. Marshal Mac McClendon, uh, who uh, I remember very well because he was a big John Wayne fan. After the Unsolved Mysteries broadcast about the escape from Alcatraz, the U.S. Marshal Service had posted a, a number and anyone who had information, uh, you know, was asked to call into that number. And a woman who identified herself only as Kathy called in. She then went into details about how they escaped from Alcatraz. And what she said was that they did make it to shore, that um, a former sheriff from Florida, uh, who was a relative of hers, uh, had gone there and helped them, had picked them up and had brought them back uh, to this region of the country. And that uh, 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 after that point and prior to them settling into this particular house, that they had been assisted by the Ku Klux Klan uh, and that they had relatives in the Ku Klux Klan and that the Klan had assisted in hiding them. Now, I, I didn't know what to think about this. I'm gonna be honest with you. I grew up in the deep south and, and right on the border between you know, Florida, Georgia, and Alabama. And I never saw the Klan until I actually moved to Indiana. It was the first time that I ever encountered the Ku Klux Klan. So I didn't really know what to think about it. But um, I began to put two and two and two and two together and come up you know, with who this person was. And I realized that she was indeed related to a family that lived near Greenwood, um, that she did indeed have uh, an ancestor who had been the sheriff of Jackson County, and that the family did have a connection to the Ku Klux Klan in Alabama. And uh, it made her start to seem pretty reliable to me as, as a witness, at least up to that point. The escape triggered the greatest manhunt in San Francisco's history as agents of the FBI, Coast Guardsmen, Highway Patrol, Sheriff's deputies, and local police joined in the search. In his contacts with different law enforcement officers, Cox unexpectedly got a chance to see the confidential Marshal Service file on the Alcatraz escape. The more he learned, the more he became convinced that the informant had real information on the case. The events that took place near Greenwood in Jackson County, Florida during the late 1980s sparked Dale Cox's interest in the case, and he had copies of the files from both the FBI and the U.S. Marshal Service. These files included numerous reports on information received about the escapees. Cox concluded that the plan of Morris and the Anglin brothers had been to get out of the country. FBI documents from right after the escape even mentioned Brazil as a possible destination. The problem was that the escapees had no money. Cox does not believe the stories that they were helped by gangsters or mafia bosses. 
Yeah, um, I think they didn't have much money when they got out of Alcatraz. Now, there's all kinds of stories about them getting to know the gangster Bumpy Johnston or, or, or these other people and these people giving them large sums of money. Um, gangsters don't get rich by giving other people large sums of money. And I don't know that, you know, a uh, an African-American gangster from New York really is going to give a couple of you know, guys from South Georgia and the backwoods of Florida, a lot of money just to live on in glorious style on if they escaped Alcatraz without wanting something back from them. And I don't know what they could offer him back. So, so I don't, I don't believe those types of stories. So I believe they got out and that they came back and that they were flat broke and they needed a source, you know, of income. Leaving the United States and being able to survive in a new country requires money. Morris and the Anglins had only one real way to get more money, and that meant committing more crimes, which is exactly what Dale Cox believes they did. The Anglin brothers prior to this bank robbery um, had done mostly small things. They, they had done you know some, some breakings and entering. They had done some uh, thefts, things like that. And so maybe passing a bad check might be a way for them to pick up a little money, little money. Uh, gas money or food money or whatever they needed. I really think they were living kind of hand to mouth. And um, that led me to um, an incident that happened in Brundage, Alabama that was investigated by the FBI. And what happened in Brundage is that a gentleman went into a store there and uh, he cashed a $25 check uh, written on the local bank. Um, he used a false identity uh, beyond having a false identity, he had multiple forms of identification. Now that is something that, you know, your friends at Alcatraz probably could help you get. And he had multiple forms of identification. They took the check. Uh, the check went through, like checks do, to the bank and it was, um, it was a bad check. Not only was there no money in the account, there was no account for there to be money in. It was a completely, you know, fake check and fake account. A $25 bad check is not something that would normally hit the desk of an FBI agent, even back in the 1960s. This one did, and there's a reason why. The store manager starts to ask about, you know, who might have passed this check, and the store clerk start telling him, well, you know, we thought he looked like that guy that escaped from Alcatraz. And the store manager is like, really? And the more they talk, um, the more they start going, which one? The tall one with blue eyes and blonde hair, which was John Anglin. And uh, the FBI in Mobile was notified. The FBI came and investigated it. They interviewed um, the, the people who worked in the store. They picked up this check. They sent it to the FBI lab. And the FBI lab was unable to say whether or not John Anglin wrote that check. Uh, the handwriting was close enough that they could not uh, disprove that uh, he was the person who wrote and signed that check. And I feel to this day like John Anglin probably passed that $25 check in Brundage, Alabama. It's the kind of thing that um, if you're wanting to make a big score, you'd have tried to pass a big check, but it was a small check. It was a $25 check on a non-existent account. And I wonder if from, you know, the 1962-1963 era, there weren't probably a series of those across the region um, that the, the FBI never knew about because the stores just ate the expense and never bothered to call them. $25 checks would not generate the kind of money needed for three men to flee the country and possibly live for the rest of their lives. Cox believes that the escapees needed a bigger hit and that they may have found it in Mariana, Florida. Mariana is the county seat of Jackson County. Jackson County adjoins Seminole County where they were from on one side and it adjoins Houston County where they robbed the Bank of Columbia on the other side. So again, you're dealing with this, these connected areas that are almost where they were, but not quite. You know, areas that they would have known the roads, they would have known everything about. And um, you have uh, three men one of whom has something of a Creole accent. Uh, he's a shorter guy. Um, Frank Morris lived many years in Louisiana. 
Frank Morris was shorter than the other two. Um, they rob a bank in broad daylight uh, in the morning uh, in Mariana, Florida. The similarities between that bank robbery and the robbery of the Bank of Columbia, Alabama are stunning. Uh, whoever these three men were uh, did it almost in the style that the um, Anglin brothers did when, when the three Anglin brothers robbed the Bank of Columbia. Robert R. Stanley worked just a door or two down from the bank. In 1963, I was working for Thrift Department Store uh, located on uh, Lafayette Street, and we're standing in the alley right behind our store. And uh, this portion right here was uh, two wooden doors. They opened up, and we had a, a, a warehouse located in there. Every morning I would come down and open the door, prop it open, close the screen door and hook it. That morning before the robbery, I walked out the door. There was a gentleman walking around out here looking uh, right across the, the, uh, where that light pole is. It was a smaller light pole at that time. Uh, he was asking me the question, uh, did I know where the uh, telephone lines went to these buildings? I said, sure, we can follow them. Unlike the Bank of Columbia building, the one in Mariana no longer stands. Stanley was still able to show us where things happened. They have removed the, the bank building, the original bank building. This was part of the building also, but the drive up was right located right along here. The uh, drive up window was open here, and uh, when they Went in the bank, they uh, told uh, Bauer Sandusky that to go get his car, give him the keys to his car, and he said he didn't drive his car that day. He said, yeah, you did, because we saw you drive and park it. So they went and got his car, pulled the car through the drive up, loaded the money, there was a hundred and something thousand dollars that they got, into Bauer Sandusky's uh, car, left here, went to Alford, to the uh, Alford's uh, dump site, at what we call Alford City. They had a dump site down there. They left his car there, got in their car, and disappeared. Nobody has ever found out who they were. Years would pass before John McDaniel would become sheriff of Jackson County, but he too was on the scene of the Citizens Bank robbery of 1963. I was in and out of there on a regular basis. I went in the back door and just walked down the hallway and they would be getting set up and ready to go with the day's work. And I made the comment, somebody gonna come in here and rob this place one day. And Mr. Nose said, no boy, it's gonna help me. I said, okay. <laughs> then uh, it wasn't long before it did. And I had, when the bank robbery happened, I happened to go by for some reason by the bank at that time and I didn't see anything at all. It's just I know that at that time I'd gone out to caravan restaurant and met with Pokey Fordham about something when when they robbed the bank and that's about it. I know they took uh, Bauer Sandusky's car and went south of town off the of Panama City cutoff and went in there on the Alford cutoff and hit it back in the woods back there and uh, got it I think they got it stuck back in there in the sand back there. That's about all I know about that one. Cox believes that the robberies, like the one at Citizens Bank in 1963, may have funded the plan by the Anglin brothers and Frank Morris to settle in Brazil. He also thinks they may have been in the Bahamas from 1962 to around 1965. The U.S. Marshal Service recently investigated a claim that Clarence Anglin died in the Bahamas. Fingerprints showed that the man in question was not Anglin but Cox believes it is possible that the Anglins and Morris were on Grand Bahama Island many years before. There's no prison walls around me or prison bars to see There's no guards to around me there's nothing holding me a 
But still I am a prisoner Not free to come and go I'm a prisoner of your love, dear More than you ever know Oh yes, you are my jailer But lady, you've captured me You've got me at your mercy Little pity 